Chapter 17 The Winds of Change The heat of the day began to build, and Gary was doing his best to stay cool and calm while continually moving the loads about the construction site. His brow would sweat more than this usually. Perhaps it was not as late in the day as he thought it was. His efficiency at the tasks won him repeated contracts with builders and helped his career grow to be the stable source of income that it was. Yet the odd truth was that he was as efficient to merit such success not for the purpose of achieving the success, but only because it was an engaging thrill for him to excel at the work of this station. He remembers reading about the psychology of happiness from the 1970s, the work of Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Once he heard the name pronounced, it was not one he was likely to forget. The study described a state of psychological being in which a person's skills nearly met the challenge posed to their skills, inducing a person to ignore the passage of time as they work to perfectly connect their skills to the successful completion of the task. A state of mind he termed flow. It could be summed up as time, indeed, does fly when one is having fun. The notion being that fun is the near total engagement of a person's skills during the performance of an endeavor that suits well their interests and abilities. Gary had long realized that sitting high in the tower crane was where he easily found his flow. The flow of perspiration above his eyes, though, caused him to think that it was still somewhat early in the day. He enjoyed losing track of time while up here. His enjoyment reminded him that he was more focused on the work than the time it took. Yet he also knew that he had to stay vigilant. He once worked for twelve solid hours on the crane without a break and did not understand why he was easily agitated at that time when he had not stopped to eat. Hunger could be a problem, as could bathroom breaks. He giggled, knowing full well that this room was also his bathroom. The plastic bags and bottle were in reach beside him at his station. When need be, he would use them and send them down the chute, another reality of the job he had come to accept as normal, while knowing there was no one else working at the site imagining that he was doing that. The seclusion would get to him on occasion, but he knew that he was not really separated from them. He was the only person who every other person in each work crew on the entire site was aware of. They all knew his name, even if they really didn't know much about him. He liked to think that in some way, he was like the weather reporter for the local news. Everyone knew the person for the job performed, and each person relied on the job being performed to help them along their way but very few could say anything about the characteristics of the person other than how they performed the job. He wasn't really a celebrity, as he wasn't celebrated, but he did enjoy a certain specific notoriety among the rest at the job site and in the industry itself. It wasn't much different in social stature than that of the weather reporter, And given the high vantage and long stretching views, sometimes his station provided similar insight into the atmospheric composition and the direction in which elements that would be of concern to him and in turn the entire site were moving. This is G in the sky, he said into his radio. There's some fast moving cover to the north and a large blanket heading in from the northwest. Does anyone have an eye on the local radar? We're watching for you, G, came the response. And there is a cold front coming our way. 
Gary noticed the whipping of the two flags on the arm of the crane, rippling from the wind that was gaining speed. Winds are nearly at shutdown speeds, and we think we can get one or two more loads before calling it. The crane swayed atop the tower without bearing the weight of a load, and the current of air that moved along the frame of his station whistled as it rippled itself against the translucent structure. Moments like these were meant for courage. He could not get his daughter out of his head and pictured her smiling at him when she was younger. He closed his eyes and focused on that picture, reveling in her innocent beauty and his unconditional devotion to her. He felt the rocking of the tower come to a slow stop, and he opened his eyes. He lifted his radio. Not to be a buzzkill, he said, but I'll get you one more load, and then we'll lock down until after the heavy weather. Anything you can give us is above and beyond. One more? Affirmative. Where to? The wind picked up again, and his jaw clenched with stalwart resolve. He heard the direction and maneuvered the crane into position while his mind generated the strongest comforting distraction that it could. His thoughts were split evenly, and he trusted his training and experience to perform the work needed while he refused to allow the fear to stop him. He knew he was frightened, and he looked out to the horizon where the cold front was on the move towards them. Way off in the distance, he saw a flash of light in the clouds as the hot and cold fronts met and ground together with electrical harmony. The notion that the storm he could see could be his end resonated through his spine and bones. This was no time for concern. He only need get the job done. Concern for something other than the job could cause him to make a mistake, and mistakes would not be permissible. Not by his standard or the professional standard that he would uphold. He heard humming of a familiar and popular song his daughter had played for him countless times, played for herself and subjected him to countless times, and it took him slightly by surprise to realize he was humming it, not because he thought someone else was humming it, but because it was evidently ingrained into his psyche and held a position that he accessed to bring him comfort during this stress-laden time. Not knowing the words to the verse of the song, he hummed the rhythm of the phrases. When the wind gusted again, he voiced the notes and found himself singing the chorus loudly. He was not at all unaware that he was using his breath, his control of the air, to overshadow the natural contours and waves of the air as though he was in conversation with the sky itself, using his emotions to placate its voracious appetites. He sang and found solace in communicating with the awesome powers of nature, recognizing that he lived by his tenacity and their mercies. The last load was in place, and he waited as the crew disengaged the chains. The clear sky was almost a taunt, as he could see the turbulence that swirled around him, pulling the darker clouds nearer. The evidence of his position was not so much in the meticulous form of his work as much as it was in the mental discipline he had to muster so much of the time. Repetitions be damned, he knew what processes his thoughts had to take to keep him focused on the work and the basic steps of surviving work of this kind. He welcomed the sway of the tower as the load was released because it was less founded on the chaotic power of the winds. 
He counted the seconds down to test the efficacy of the crew and soon heard the well-paced chime of a voice on the radio signifying the last maneuvers of the day. He began the final lift to secure the crane and the flow of air caused a circular rocking of the tower. This was the kind of flow that he did not enjoy and the thoughts of the different types of flow sheltered him from his rising anxiety. He redoubled his focus to keep his careful ways during this home stretch. The whirring of the mechanisms provided a rhythm that he focused on to further avoid the feelings evoked by the gusts that were occurring with greater frequency than before. He heard himself humming again, the song from earlier, but this time in syncopation with the mechanical rhythm. The crane reached its stopping point, and he took a deep breath. He had three more tasks to undertake. Disconnecting his harness and standing from his seat, he slightly opened the door and connected his harness to the guardrail outside. The wind pressed on the door and howled as it entered his enclave. He sucked it in through his teeth, as though showing it his serious nature. The wind must have found it amusing, and rustled off into other parts of the sky. He wasted no time and stepped outside. He had to walk down the arm and sound the machinery at the end, locking it up and making his way back to then shut the control console. He stepped carefully, like he was marching in slow motion, and brought the entire surface area of his foot down at once with each step. He alternated his grip from one hand to the other as he moved along the catwalk that bobbed and shimmied, So much of his focus was on every single moment that he ignored the tears being pressed from his eyes by the wind until one ran along his temple. He gripped the guardrails hard as the wind picked up speed around him and the metal frame. He clung to it suddenly as it began to bounce back and forth in the sky. He told himself the entire movement was less than inches, barely noticeable to anyone below who was watching him. He tried to imagine anyone below watching him, anyone in the sight, any drivers of the cars moving along, any pedestrian, anything to keep him calm as he rode out this movement. And relative stillness returned, and he could continue walking, pulling along the metal clip that locked him to the crane. The sweet slink of the metal on metal provided something to focus his hearing on, something that could block out the continual dull roar of the gases swirling about him. Like the invisible fingers of death itself, The wind touched Gary and nudged him perpetually, yet could not grip him in total. Moving forward with absolute fear and respect for the world he was moving through, Gary reached the box on the far end of the arm. Opening the control hatch, he shut the mechanical systems down and felt the vibrations of those systems come to a gradual halt. One less set of motions to contend with. He happily closed the hatch and slowly turned himself around, realizing how far of a walk he had ahead of him. One step to begin the journey and subsequent steps to keep him on track. The wind lashed without passionate anger, and he respected it as it danced upon his shoulders and back. He thought of his daughter. He thought of how he wanted to know that his memories of her smile would not be the only memories he would have of her, but that he would make it down from the tower to see her again, 
The notion of death is one he had to embrace as a possibility, for that was how he defeated the fear. Whenever he was descending, he always reminded himself to give great attention to the nuances of his daughter's behavior, to cherish her for who she was and how she was becoming her own person. In reminding himself to do that, he would spend time with her and make that time the most important of his time alive, noticing everything about her and knowing that he had reason to challenge death with his work. If death would claim Gary, it would be taking a man who was ready because he spent no time overlooking the beauty in his life. Death granted the courage of the man's continuance, and nature's breath kindly let him pass. Reaching the console, he shut down the electrical control systems and cleaned up his space. He looked out of the window at the approaching clouds and then down to the street level. Exhaling heavily, he wiped the streaked tears from his temple and brought his eyes back to the clouds. Please, he said, and then picked up his radio. Skybox is closed up, heading down. Safe travels, G, the radio sang back. Gary's eyes stayed fixed on the cloud bank rolling forward. Please, he said again, let me reach the ground safely. As though acknowledging his plea, a flash of lightning illuminated part of the clouds. He stepped back out and locked the pod. He walked with care towards the cat ladder and quickly unfastened the harness that locked him to the guardrail of the catwalk so he could move it to the vertical guardrail. Perhaps displeased by his audacity to address its power, the wind exploded with great speed all around him. The lock fell from his grip through his glove and... His other hand searched for the guardrail to grip with such speed and force of his muscles that the sudden movement caused a shift of his weight that his legs, firmly planted, could not keep pace with. His balance fluttered, and he unbelievably felt one of his feet lose its connection to the plane of the catwalk. His adrenal glands surged, and his thoughts resounded with only visions of his wife holding him firmly in the secure pantheon of moments that comprised their marriage. He thought he heard his voice call out her 